Hey, what is going on everybody out there today? This is K-Rail reporting live from Park City, Utah. And I said I was coming on at 1.30 Mountain Standard Time, but I might be one or two minutes early. Please forgive me for those of you that are watching and those of you that will be watching down the road. It's a wonderful day today. It was nuking snow this morning, absolutely nuking. And that's why I had this sweatshirt on because I have been cold all day. Now the snow subsided and the sun is starting to come out, which is all good with me. Anyway, I've got my really good friend, John Parker, that's going to be joining me soon. And um, I'm so stoked to talk about him, uh, to talk to him. We've got a lot to talk about and a lot to go over. He is a awesome fitness professional out in San Diego, California. We've known each other a few years. Behind the scenes, we know a lot of people in the fitness industry through the social media pipelines. But John and I just met in person for the first time after a couple years, about a month ago. And we just like talk shop like two magpies. And I'm like, dude, we got to do a Facebook Live together. So he's going to be joining me shortly. But you know how it, how it works with me. I'm a big movement guy. And you should not sit for more than two hours at a time every single day without doing a movement break. So with that being the case, I'm going to do another movement break for you. And I'm going to show you something cool to do with my fun tool, the exercise wand, also known as the health wand. One of the four horsemen from classical times. I did one of these the other day. and I'm going to give you another one today. You ready? You ready? Okay, here we go. Let me get my chair out of the way so I don't trip. Here we go. Health wand. So this is a yoga-inspired exercise that's really good to open up your shoulders and your brain capacity and your wrists and your elbows in the middle of the afternoon when you are in need of a movement break. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to hold our wand up above our head and slightly behind our head like this. I'm going to go sideways. See how it's slightly behind my head? Maybe right about there. Now, we're going to take our feet and we're going to angle both of our toes to the left side this way, about 45 degrees. And we're going to do a bend like this. I'm going to get in frame. Similar to an extended triangle in yoga. And we're going to go as far as we can. We're going to face our eyeballs up toward the sky. Right there. And we're going to hold for about five seconds. Then we're going to come up. Turn our toes the opposite way. I'm going to shift to get in the frame. And then we're going to bend this way. Let me get all the way in because my arms are like 900 feet long. And then we're going to lower ourselves down like this. Oh yeah, you feel that? Did you hear my shoulder crack? Oh, it feels so good. Then we're going to come up. And what you're going to do... Look at that. Isn't that cool? It's like three-dimensional. When I saw one of the final Saw movies that was in 3D, it looked like that. Like stuff was coming right into the screen. Anyway, you're going to do that three times. Each side. In the middle of the afternoon, when your shoulders are feeling tight and you're at your office and you're in need of a movement break. And if you don't have an authentic health wand like this, a broomstick will work or a piece of PVC pipe. PVC pipe will work. And that's that. I'm hot. Sweatshirt's coming off already. Woo! I got warm really fast. Okay. Now let's get back down to business. <sighs> got to take a quick deep breath to center myself. All right, let me see if I can get my friend John Parker on right now. Where is he? He's, I don't see him. Hopefully he'll be on this feed very soon. In the meantime, let's talk about kombucha. Right here, homemade kombucha, homemade brew. This is what really makes me happy. And you always got to look for your happy place and find something that is non-destructive that is really good for you to use as a buffer for anything that's bothering you out in life. This is called Dark Mist, this blend right here. And I've got to be honest with you. It's a combination of, I made it with black tea. It's got cucumber in it and honeydew and mint. But honestly, it tastes a little bit like pickle juice. But it's got really good carbonation, homemade carbonation, my ad. I don't add carbonation like a lot of companies do. And it tastes really good. Kind of tastes like a little bit on the sweet side pickle juice. But anyway, I don't judge. If you're going to make some kombucha at home, make some blends that, that work for you and that taste good. As long as they're clean and healthy, that's all that matters. I don't know where John is at. Whoops, that's the wrong button. Where is he? My goodness, where is he? I don't see him. Well, until he pops on, I'm going to keep talking smack. Now, next item of business. One of the things we're going to be talking about today are these babies right here. What do you think of that? Okay, this is called an Indian Club. If y'all haven't seen these before, it's about time that you do. We've got a bunch of workshops coming up in the very new fruit, near, bleh, very near future with Indian Clubs International with my colleagues, Kelly Manzoni and Paul Terrace Volkovinsky. And John is going to be hosting us out in San Diego at Mesa Rim Climbing Gym. So we are inviting all of y'all to come out there. We still have about five to 10 slots open. So it's going to be April 20th, the day before Easter. I know it's on Easter weekend, but don't worry about it. Just come to the workshop because these are amazing tools for your wrist, 
for your elbow, for your shoulder, for your back, for all in between. Hold on, I got a text message coming in. Got to flick that off the screen. And they're also really good for the brain function. Because when you use Indian clubs, you do this thing called crossing the midline of your body. So if you cut me in half right here, or if you like did this dotted line right here, yes, right there, right down my nose, and you cross it with any kind of pattern that you're doing or any kind of exercise. So I'm big into cross lateral patterns or cross body patterns as they're called. Indian clubs, we swirl those things around the midline of our body like this all the time. And then we do these circular patterns and these motions that we're not used to doing. Let me see if I can find John. He's still not here. I have no idea where he is. So anyway, when you cross the midline of your body, that fires up a lot of neurons in your brain. It turns the computer on like that. It's like taking your computer, putting it on pause, and then hit, unhitting the pause button. Hold on, he's, he's texting me. Hold on for two seconds. Hopefully I was on there the whole time and didn't lose anybody. Technology, you gotta love it, right? So anyway, when you cross the midline of your body, automatically, <laughs> he thought we were on Instagram. We're gonna have a good laugh out of this when he comes on. <laughs> I, made a, I made a point that it was Facebook. Anyway, when you cross the midline of your body, regardless if you're using an instrument or your bare hands, and if you're doing an exercise on the ground and you're crossing the midline of your body, let's take bicycle crunches, for example. You lie on your back, and then you go like this back and forth, right? Knee to elbow, knee to elbow. So you're focusing your opposite knee to your opposite leg. That's called crossing the midline of your body. That has what's called a high neurological load. So when you hear the word neurological load, it automatically translates to a lot of brain cells in the computer being fired off, like a Gatling gun back in the war years ago. That is so beneficial for you, words can barely describe it. It is quintessential, in my opinion, to reverse the aging process. Because right now, big time, my big time line of work is reversing the aging process and longevity. And that's why I'm doing my seven day vegan diet, I might add right now, my no animal product whatsoever vegan diet. So when you cross the midline of your body with complex movement patterns, you fire up those synapses in the brain, thus translating to better brain function and better ability to concentrate. And also it increases the plasticity of the brain cells. So you're doing basically the opposite of what you'd be doing if you drank like 16 beers a night. Hold on a second. Oh no, we're having a little bit of problems. Hang tight for a split second here. Let me see if I can find him. Bear with me, bear with me. Um, Anyway, he just texted me and then he vanished. I'm not gonna get back off because it's gonna be too much of a, a pain because I'm gonna have to come back. Anyway, when you fire up those synapses in the brain, that keeps the brain fresh. So it increases, hold on a second, he's right here, hold on. Okay, I'm back. Now, um, when you do this stuff with Indian clubs, so let's, let's, call a, let's talk about a, a heart shape pattern. So a heart shape pattern goes like this around your body and it comes up like this and around. So you cross the midline of your body and you have to concentrate really hard on what you're doing. And you're doing a complex movement, so you have to concentrate on the actual technique involved with that pattern. So you're doing a bunch of things in your brain and it's firing up and there's like squirrels running around and they're like in a cyclone. That would be 10 times better than doing a crossword puzzle or whatever those games are they tell you to play. Hold on, I'm gonna be able to figure this out in a couple seconds. I still don't see them in there. As soon as I see him pop in, I'll, jump, I'll, I'll have him jump in. But anyway, that is the, that's the start of everything with Indian clubs. Then when we start doing two clubs at once, those benefits start to increase. So your brain function goes through the, brain, you, the roof even more. Then when you start doing it, there he is. All right, hold on, hold on. Add, add. Be back. Stay tuned, stay tuned. Hey, Kevin. How's it going? Hold on a sec. All right. You good? Everything's good. Yeah. We're all good to go. All right. All right. Mis misconceptions are over with. So everybody, welcome to the, I would like to welcome my guest at this time. John, I was just going over the, um, the, the mental benefits of Indian ah. clubs. So we're going to be able to, John's going to be able to easily chime in here. So first, let me give you a little bit more background on John. He has, uh, like I said before, we've met a couple years ago in the fitness circles on social media. We met in person about a month ago and we started talking shop and I'm like, dude, we got to do a Facebook live together because we have so much good stuff and content to talk about and you resonate with everything that I'm doing and vice versa. So John has, has basically been self-taught with Indian clubs and meals um, and some Gata and well, we'll get to the Gata thing in a minute over the past year, half or so. Yeah, probably about two and, years um, for me. Okay. Two years. So 
teaching yourself how to use these tools is very difficult. I will tell you, I, I had the pleasure of, you know, when I first started, I kind of did it all myself as well. But when I met people that really knew what they were doing, it's just like, wow, you like your eyes just get so wide open and you're like, holy cow, how did I miss that? Because there are so many nuances involved with Indian clubs. It's not even funny, but I have to admit, John has made a lot of great progress just being self-taught. And I've seen a lot of hacks out there and I'm sure he's seen the hacks too that act like they know what they're doing and they don't know what they're doing. But I like to stress to people that it is quintessentially important. I mean, 0.01% of the population can learn something from watching a video or being self-taught. When you meet someone in person who knows what they're doing, it just, it changes your game so much. And that's why I stress to everyone out there listening, the importance of coming to a workshop that we do because that you can't beat the, the one-on-one -on -one eye contact that you have with somebody because we can clean so many things up so fast, it's not even funny. But John has been doing a wonderful job and I'm thrilled about it. And I was just talking to them, John, about the, the mental benefits of crossing the midline of the mm -hmm. body of Indian clubs. So do you have anything to add about, about um, the neurological load and like cross lateral patterns and stuff like that? I'm sure you do a lot of that in your training. Uh, I definitely do. I, I appreciate every aspect of it. Uh, it's the type of thing for me, like I said, I'm self-taught, but when I see videos of people like you and Paul uh, Wokowinski, I'm just blown away. I'll step in front of a mirror and try to emulate some of these patterns and it's not nearly as smooth. So like you mentioned, it's better to have professional instruction from it. But even there, I'm making a lot of progress on my own with some of these combinations and it's like things just start to click. And when they click, you know your brain is learning. So in the beginning, it's very yeah. clunky, but once it comes together, it looks smooth. Once you film yourself and you're like, wow, that actually looks good. That's how you know those neurological benefits are taking place. Yeah, that's, that's a fabulous way to put it. And it's really, um, it's invigorating. And it's like, it's a very big, for me, it's, a, it's an emotional high. It would be considered to me like a runner's high when I work on a complex pattern and I finally get it. You just kind of know when you get it. You're just like in a groove and a flow and it feels mm -hmm. good. And it's like, it's like with any other type of exercise that you work at and practice you know when you're on and you know when you're off. But that one in particular, like Indian clubs, when you start doing patterns, it all just falls into place and just everything just feels good and alive and your brain feels good and you feel positive about it. And it's, it's second to none in my opinion. The only, the only thing that comes close to that as far as like um, endorphin release for me is running barefoot. Mm. That's about the closest thing, which I wanted to talk to you about that too because I know you're a big naturalist guy and I want to talk about earthing. Do you ever utilize the word earthing out there in your fitness practice? I do to a certain extent. You know, with having clients like mine, I train a lot of doctors. So when you throw around these words, you get a lot of uh, kickback from stuff like that. But yeah. a lot of my mentors, they'll talk about it. And with the health practitioners that I associate with, we talk about grounding a lot. And being from the countryside, being amongst all these boulders and doing a lot of hiking, I think it's ever important. And even if you don't believe in earthing and the benefits of it, you can feel different when you walk barefoot in the dirt or in the sand or for you walking in the snow. There's something primal that takes place in this calm and this ease that happens. So I absolutely believe in the benefits of earthing and what it can do for us. And not to mention getting rid of all the electromagnetic frequencies that are in the environment, constantly being surrounded sure. by Wi-Fi. When I go on hikes and we, did, we just have so many great rocks out here in San Diego, and being in between yeah, the, I've been seeing them in the yeah place. these beautiful boulders yeah. again you just have this mental clarity that you don't get when you're in the city yeah and dude the connection points out here in park city are off the charts what, what you're talking about and and i would say they're parallel to san diego it's probably a similar feel and stuff and i was doing a, i was making it a practice last year to do at least one barefoot hike uh, every week and i was literally i got to the point where i was able to hike barefoot and oftentimes the trails out here are they're jagged, there's jagged right. rocks, there's stumps, there's, you know, all kinds of things that aren't very conducive to barefoot hiking. Mm -hmm. But I, I worked my way up to it. And there's one of my favorite hikes here is called Iron Canyon. And it's, it's kind of, it's very rocky. And it's not a long hike, but it's a very steep one. And it's, it's got, if you have like an hour of time to kill and you want to just get some exercise, it's a great one oh, to cool. do. And I did it barefoot last year. Yeah. And the, the views are just astounding up there. But that whole connection to the earth is so critically important. And all the studies I've done on earthing and grounding are they all say the same thing. They said, literally, you can walk across your lawn barefoot and back like 30 seconds on the grass and back home, back in the door, and you're completely grounded. And you mentioned the electromagnetic fields. 
you word it all off and basically you get recentered. Just 30 mm -hmm. seconds. That's it. And you know what? So, it's mean, actually easy for some people to do because if you have um, any sort of granite tile in your home, you can actually just walk on that granite tile and you'll get some similar effects. It's a natural material. That's, that is interesting. Mm. And, and when it comes to the outdoors, I heard every surface minus blacktop will give you that same effect. So even when I run on concrete in the winter or summer, I'm still grounding. The only time you're not grounding is blacktop because there's a certain ingredient in it that cuts that, that connection point off to the ground beneath you. But concrete, you go right through it. So it's still, you're still grounding. Interesting. Which I find. Yeah, amazing. that's very cool. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. Now, I got to bring up coffee. Mm -hmm. Because we had a little chat, I think, two weeks ago, and you, had a, you posted something about coffee or whatever. And I know everyone out there drinks coffee. I, I probably had two cups of coffee my entire life, and I choked them both mm -hmm. down. I was under duress and stress from friends who were forcing <laughs> me to drink. And like, you got to be a man, right? I'll drink some coffee. And I was like, Whoa. it took me like an hour to drink both cups. And by the time I got to the bottom, it was like ice cold. And I'm like, oh. And I struggled them down. So I just don't drink coffee. It never was a thing of mine. But I know about the backstory of coffee. And you mentioned something in your post about always make sure if you're going to and I used to be under the same impression. If you're going to do something organic, mm -hmm. like I'm always about organic, but I, people like ask me, if I was just to do one thing, I can't afford all that like, organic stuff, but if I could do this one thing, what would it be? And I used to be the same guy that you were talking about the, last week where you're like, always go organic with your coffee because everything else is like blah. Here's the deal. I used to think that until I came across, who's now a friend of mine, Steve Brewster, who owns this awesome coffee shop down in Salt Lake, mm -hmm called Mill Creek Coffee Roasters. If any of you are ever downtown Salt Lake, go to Mill Creek Coffee Roasters. It's fantastic. Cheap, sleazy plug. Anyway, I literally went down there and I had this long talk with him. I was talking about kombucha and all these other things and coffee. And I explained to him, I asked him all these questions about the process of getting the beans because he gets them like fresh and then he roasts them right on site. And he's, well, he's very well known for his, his aromas and his flavors and all these things. And I was talking to him about the difference between organic and, and non-organic coffee. And he's sitting there smirking, shaking his head back and forth. I'm like, what? And he's like, it's all, it's all fluff. He said, don't buy into any of that organic stuff. He said, all the coffee beans are organic. He goes, these coffee beans come from third world countries. He, he literally has been to the places, the production facilities in like Chile and all these other places. He said, I've been to all of them. He said, I've traveled the world. He said, they're so poor in these countries, they can't even afford the chemicals and pesticides. They have people working in the fields all day. He said, if, if there's any chemicals, it's very minimal. He said, and all these companies in America just capitalize on it and act like their organic coffee is organic and it's better than all the rest and everything. And they mark it up like three to four times what it should be cost, what it should cost. And it's all fluff. Mm. So I'm curious to know if you've ever heard that before. Uh, no, I haven't. I mean, the research I've done on coffee and some of the podcasts I've heard, I mean, you got to think about yeah. something like Folger's coffee. That's definitely not going to be yeah. as high. I always go to. Yeah, Ford. that's not going to be as <laughs> high quality as a, you know, a single source origin, like a really high quality coffee bean. So everything that I've heard yeah. about coffee, I mean, it's a huge industry because you mentioned that so many people drink it. It's very important yeah. to know the quality of those coffee beans. And also it's all, it's very important to know if there's any mold toxicity going on in that coffee, mm -hmm. which is extremely, extremely common. So now a lot of the companies are yeah. testing out the mold. Um, there are things like aflatoxin in coffee, definitely things that you want to stay away from because they are toxic to the body. So for me, I'm always buying the best quality coffee from the known brands that I trust. And even if it's fluff, I'm still going to keep on doing it because <laughs> the opposite is <laughs> not worth it. And the same thing goes for food. I mean, you have to eat organic right food no matter what. I was just going to make that point. I'm like, and, and take John's advice to heart across the boards. Don't just look at coffee, but look at everything. Know where it comes from. Do your research. Try to find people to talk to about it. Visit farms. Visit companies. If anyone is like, uh, they've, they've got nothing to hide, then they should have an open door policy mm -hmm. and say, oh yeah, sure, come to our farm, come to our company. And I've been invited to go to a lot of places too. I just, I never can fit it into my schedule. But be like, yeah, come down to the farm, come down to the plant, come down to the company. We'd love to have you show you around, give you a tour and blah, blah, blah. And you know, we have this awesome chocolate place in town here called Ritual Chocolate. And they, they like make it right there live in these big vats and you can go and do tours there. And they let you in, they show you how they make it. It's all like organic Peruvian chocolate nice. and all these different ones. It's fantastic. Next time you come to town, we'll oh, go there. Oh, awesome. We'll go for We'll go for a bike ride or hike and we'll get some drinking chocolate there to finish off our nice. day. They have cold drinking chocolate and hot drinking chocolate and an abundance of coffees and stuff as well. It's right up your alley. But in the big picture, always 
you know, do your research on all the food you eat, not just coffee. And if I was a coffee drinker, I would still do the same thing because people always throw the conventional thing in my face and say, oh, there's no difference between conventional produce and organic. That's a bunch of fluff and a bunch of fear mongers and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, whatever. You believe what you want. I'll believe what mm -hmm. I want. And I'll just keep on going down the road, which now that we're talking about coffee, we might as well talk about lectins. Mm -hmm. So I was approached um, a couple days ago by a friend of mine and said, hey, what are your thoughts on lectins? Mm -hmm. and, and being that I'm doing this seven day no animal challenge right now, I'm gonna be eating a lot of beans and grains mm -hmm. through this seven day span time. Not that I don't normally, but, but more so than normal. So in my opinion, so for those of you at home, lectins are these compounds that are found in grains and beans predominantly, but they're also in fruits, vegetables, they're in like a ton of different mm -hmm. things. So there's now, the, there's now, in my opinion, I'm gonna give my case on it, and John, I wanna know what you, what you think about this. Because John is very well schooled in nutrition too, by the way. As a matter of fact, what's your, sir, what's your background in that again? Oh, with nutrition, so I started out with the Czech uh, Institute Holistic Lifestyle Coach, and currently I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you say that because it's a very long title. <laughs> So I, the reason I keep coming back to food items is because John is very well read on nutrition like myself. So the, the new fear monging diet, I call it the fear monger diet, is lectins are bad for you, lectins are poison. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so lectins are found in pretty much, like I said, beans, grains, a various amount of fruits and vegetables. And I sit there and I scratch my head and I'm like, hmm. So lectins are these compounds found in these foods that allegedly in high abundant amounts block the absorption of other nutrients in the system and can cause toxicity in the mm -hmm. body. My take is that is a bunch of baloney because it's predominantly lectins that are in beans that have not been cooked and grains that have not mm -hmm. been cooked. And no one eats grains or beans that aren't mm -hmm. cooked. And then the amount of lectins in the, all those other foods that I've seen it listed in, and like I, it's like tomatoes and like a bunch of fruits and vegetables. It doesn't sound like there's a high enough amount to even cause a problem. Mm. So to me, there's literally like gurus out there now saying, oh, the lectins are bad for you and follow this diet and follow this diet. And of course, they're pushing an initiative and they have a, a, a supplement to buy that's gonna flush them out of your system and make you magically strong and, and have better brain function and all these other things. So I wanna know what your take is. I pretty much just aired my grievance on it and I think it's complete baloney and I, I do just fine on all those things that have lectins in them and I cook my beans and I cook my grains and I'm excelling on it. So what's your take on lectins and what's your thought? On well, it? as with anything like this, it is complicated because I'm a big believer in the Weston A. Price diet where you have these foods that certain uh, people have eaten for hundreds of years, thousands of years, and do just fine on them from the Inuit up in, you know, the Arctic Circle, they're eating a lot of whale blubber right. and seal animal fat, yeah. and they don't have any heart disease. So you got to think, okay, something's going on with their physiology right there. And around the world, uh, closer you get to the equator, I mean, a lot of these tribes, they would eat a higher carbohydrate diet with a lot more fruit. But you go up to the northern regions and you see, okay, there's not a lot of seasonal fruit available. So maybe these people didn't eat that much fruit or their ancestors, you and me, I mean, if we're Viking descent, maybe we didn't have Florida oranges in wintertime. So that's, <laughs> right? that's one thing to consider. Frozen oranges. Now, where I come from with this stuff, and I really believe in a lot of nutritional uh, individualization, is that it's awesome if you can handle those grains, the beans, the, the lectins. Someone like me, unfortunately, cannot just for whatever, That's, whatever reason, right. genetically, I just don't have those markers that can break down foods like that. So, uh, so a book like The Plant Paradox, it really talks about lectins. And I'm sure you know about the carnivore folks and they're very outspoken right. in nutrition. But the crazy thing mm -hmm. is sometimes these diets work really well for people, such as people with autoimmunity. Um, going on a carnivore mm -hmm. diet, eating nose to tail can be very therapeutic for them. For some people, uh -huh. eating that meat and eating red meat is going to make them very sick and they can thrive on a vegan diet. So it depends on certain markers that you have in your body. Um, and that's why I like to do the lab testing just to get a snapshot of where someone is. But I believe in guiding people on basic principles and then figuring out the individual aspects from there. So on one hand, I'm stoked for you that you can handle grains. I know I personally <laughs> cannot. I wish I could. Uh -huh. So I'm more like a, a low carb paleo approach where... I'm eating a good amount cool. of meat, a uh, good amount of vegetables, and I feel pretty damn good when I do it. And when I deviate, I don't feel so good. So it's just one of those things. I, I, you brought up a great point, and I'm going to expand on it. And I feel that you should all, the word we're looking at here is awareness, three syllable word. We all need to create awareness in our bodies with how we resonate with foods we eat, beverages we drink, how we resonate with the workouts we do, 
if you're going to CrossFit five days a week and your back is con consistently <laughs> pain in pain, your knees are hurting, your shoulders are sore, guess what? It's not resonating with your body and you shouldn't do it. You should do maybe um, three days of yoga and maybe two days of weight training or something along those lines and balance things out a little better. And if you can't, if you're like John and he's predisposed to issues with beans and, and grains and like different types of fruits and stuff and his stomach swells up like a basketball and he's got, you know, gastrointestinal upset after eating said foods, obviously he shouldn't be eating those and he knows that. So he has found what works for him. For him, it's more of a paleo approach. And I, you know, I was speaking to my friend Mark Testa the other day and we were talking about low carb diets and th they are absolutely perfectly fine for a lot of people mm -hmm. out there. Pre-diabetics, diabetics, people that are morbidly obese, 100 pounds overweight. There's a time and place for everything. So you as people have to find your groove and you have to create awareness on how your body reacts to certain things you eat and drink. And, and luckily for me, I'm able to tolerate pretty much everything. Mm. The only thing I'm not able to tolerate is alcohol <laughs> and tobacco and tobacco smoke, especially secondhand smoke. And I'm not able to tolerate cigarette butts being flicked out the window at my car when I'm driving down 224. <laughs> that is the worst of the worst. And I can't stand seeing them on the ground either. Same. This biodegradable crap, I don't mm -hmm. buy it. If you put a cigarette butt out, stomp it out and put it in the garbage can, dip it in your water to make sure it's, exp it's done, and then throw it in the garbage can. To anyone who smokes out there, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just being honest. I don't like picking up cigarette butts. And I don't like picking up straws either. Stop using straws. They're polluting the planet. Plastic. No good. Okay. I'm going to take a big deep breath. Everybody breathe with me. Good. Nice. We got to recenter ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to talk about eating disorders. Mm -hmm. Because we had talked a little bit about that in the back you know, a couple of weeks ago when you're out in town here and stuff. And then I, I was, I was mentioning some stuff on Instagram about my past eating disorder and everything else. And we go back to the awareness again and foods resonate with the body and foods that don't. But I've had um, orthorexia since I was probably uh, like undiagnosed probably easily since I was in like middle mm -hmm. school, sixth grade is when I first remember it. I remember I used to sit at the lunch table with my arms on the table like this and I would skip lunch usually three to four days a week. And I would pocket my dollar 25 that my mom would give me for lunch money. And I'd save it up by the end of the week. And then a weekend, I'd have money to go to the arcade with. <laughs> but I would suck my stomach in at the lunch table because I was afraid the kids around me were going to laugh at me and say that I had a pot belly. And I was as skinny as a bean pole, man. It started with my dad. He was strict. He was a, a military guy. He lived on a farm. He grew up on a farm doing chores after school, before school, and all these things. And I was very impressionable growing up as a child. I still am pretty impressionable. But as a child, more so. We all are very fragile. But I'm a, I'm a very highly sensitive person, and I took things to heart. So I was always sucking in my stomach. I would skip lunch half the time, and all the patterns were starting to develop at a young age, and I didn't even recognize them until years later when I got older. Um, orthorexia is a serious type of eating disorder where you take eating healthy and fitness to the extreme, and it's, it can kill you in a split second if you're not careful. And in 2008, I was 145 pounds, and I was going for 140. And I started hitting the wall. I had all kinds of crazy mood swings. My hormones were all out of jack. I was whacked big, big time. And the way an eating disorder works is your body fat percentage gets so low that your organs just start shutting down without warning. So when I finally came to the realization of how out of control I was, I started turning things around. I'm back in control now. You never, an eating disorder always chats in the back of your head. It's never gone. It's kind of like being an alcoholic. An alcoholic can't have a sip of wine. They can't have a toast at a wedding and have a sip because they go right back down tubes like that. Eating disorders are the same way. But I'm in control now. Now, the thing is, it's, men don't talk about eating disorders very often. Men don't admit they have eating disorders very often, which I didn't because I was bullheaded and I'm, I'm a macho man. And it's an underserved population. But I think eating disorders are very important to address both for women and men as well, because I see them all the time and people don't know they, they have them. I know they have them because I can spot it from a mile away because I am a victim of it myself. So my question, John, mm -hmm. to you is, what experience do you have working with people with eating disorders? Or do you have any personal experience with people you know that had them or, or were in denial or anything like that? I just want to talk about this. I think it's interesting. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. You know, if they were likely undiagnosed, these eating disorders, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's tough to talk to people about it because they feel like you are picking on them in some cases. Uh, That's how I felt. Yeah, I felt yeah it's, it's really sad. Uh, what I see now, it's actually more common among rock climbers than I realized when I started rock climbing. It's a lot of rock climbers, they will not eat. They want to be as light as possible. 
I know this one, wow. this one very talented girl who's now sponsored and she had gone from like a power lifter body type. She was heavily muscled. And over the course of maybe wow. three to four months, she shrank down so incredibly much. She probably lost about 25, 30 pounds, all in the name of climbing. I suspected that she was wow. bulimic. Wow. I can never prove it, but I would ask her close friends, hey, like we really need to watch out for this and make sure that she's not throwing up her meal. She would leave after every meal. She would leave for the bathroom like, I got to go pee. And it's like, well, were you throwing up your food or were you going pee? So it was sad <laughs> from a friend perspective. And I was never able to yeah. help this person because I'm not sure if, if it was an eating disorder or not. But I tried to offer as much sympathy and compassion to her as I could and just put reminders into her head that, hey, this is healthy eating. It's fine to eat this food. I mean, you're doing a lot of rock climbing. You're going to hit the wall if you don't. So continue forward. Well, here's the deal when it comes to eating disorders. It's, it's basically body dysmorphia is a good way of putting it. That's what I struggled from. So I would look in the mirror when I was 145 pounds and I would literally see fat on my side and I'd be pinching it and I'd go to the gym and I'd show my friend Allison. I'm like, look at this fat on my side. I gotta get rid of this. I gotta get rid of it. And it was like, like, I don't know how many hours I was awake during the day, 16 hours. Uh, I would say 15 and three quarters of those hours, I would obsess over my weight and over the fat on my side. Mm. I needed to get rid of it. And I had to do, go to like the highest extreme to do so. And it, it's a, one of the things that it's good that you mentioned the thing about climbers, because I was going to mention that it often occurs with people who are in sports, bicyclists, for mm -hmm. example, who, who do century rides and races are always, they're like fanatic about their weight because if I can lose five pounds, I can be faster and blah, blah, blah. That's totally fine. You can get dialed in, you can lose your weight and everything. But when the problem sets in is when it overtakes your life and you start losing connections with people, you start losing relationships. You start losing jobs. You start getting reprimanded at work. When it becomes all encompassing and you, everything else in your life suffers, which is what happened to me, that's when it's a problem. Because there were people that were like, like world-class athletes who came to train here in Park City who were like Olympic caliber runners and stuff, who were as lean as I was, same height, weight, and everything. Except when they got done running, they would go right to Whole Foods and eat like a 2,000-calorie salad with all these other things, all these fixins and trimmings mm -hmm. in it. So they were not out of control. They were not out of control up here. I was out of control up here and in the body as well. And it, it becomes a problem when, like I said, everything else in your life suffers. Relationships and friendships and like you cast everything off and you're, you hide from everybody else. You don't go to public things. You don't go to carnivals. You don't um, fraternize with people you normally do. You start eating like in your room secretively and, and all these different things start happening. That's when it becomes a problem. So if you're going to lose weight, for your sport to excel at it, that's one thing. And that's fine. As long as you're in control and you're, you're, you're not opposed to like eating food. And to me, it was like, I was scared to death to eat brownies. I mean, it was like, my diet was so tight. It was unbelievable. And every single day, my habit was I would burn basically 1600 calories a day and I would consume about 1400. And it, it became like, that was like a fun goal for me. And I would always do that every single seven days a week, quite no questions asked. And if I didn't do that, I felt really depressed and angry and angsty. And the next day I had to work out longer and harder and cut my calories a little bit more to make sure I was burning more than I was consuming. That's ridiculous. I should have been eating 5,000 a day Probably. for how much exercise for I was sure. doing, dude. It was, yeah, it was out of control. So just keep that in mind that it's a, it's a mind issue as much as it is an eating disorder. So if any of you guys know anyone who you think might have an eating disorder, always approach them softly too. Because like John said, we, we get offended easily and we think, you're pointing a finger of accusation at us. And then, then embarrassment comes in because you don't want to admit that you're doing it. But for me, it was, I mean, I was literally one edge away, one millimeter away from jumping into the East River in New York City. That's how out of control my mind was at the time, back in 2008. As the stock market crashed, I almost crashed into the water at the same time. And it was a bad, it was a bad spot, I flatlined. That was like the worst spot in my life. And then I, I slowly dug myself out. And now, being that I talk about it, it's way easier to stay in control. And you know, this is another thing that I find interesting. I know you're, you're not as like deep into fasting as I am, but you know the, the art of fasting, let's put it that way, pretty well. And I use it as a tool to stay, on, to stay grounded with my eating disorder. And all of the experts out there and the, the um, psychiatrists, et cetera, always say the people that shouldn't fast are, and they list like five people. And it's like pregnant women, people with eating disorders, blah, 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 blah. And they list like five. It's always people with eating disorders shouldn't do fasting because they justify it too much. And I'm completely opposite. It's like it reestablished my relationship with food. And I look forward to eating. And I look forward to going out with friends to eat. And that's something I, when I was back in 08, when I was hitting the wall, 
I would never go out to lunch. I would never go out to dinner. I would find excuses not to go to events with friends like, hey, we're going up the main street to dinner at blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, sorry. I blah, blah. And I would conjure up some kind of excuse why I couldn't go to keep myself out of there because I was afraid I was going to eat something unhealthy. It was just a fear in my brain. It was ridiculous. So I don't know. Just make sure that you keep it straight with yourself and anybody that comes around you. And well. having a support system with your friends. I mean, this stuff is very serious. Like you said, uh, the people that are fasting, uh, the pregnant women who should not be fasting, typically these people who are doing extreme dieting, whether it's something like keto or carnivore, they're also the type of people who are going to be going to high intensity interval training classes, doing CrossFit seven days a week. So they're already going down that path. And it's something in their head that says you can't ever stop. I know because I've been there to an extent, but I've had to come around because the same issues happen where your hormones start to suffer, the relationships start to suffer. So those extreme personality types, they can manifest in so many different ways, whether it's eating, doing drugs, exercising too much. And it's right. hard for me to use the word balance because it's, it's a tough word because it's tough to maintain that equilibrium. But it is about having balance in your life and exercise and your relationships. All these things need to be more equal parts rather than saying, I'm okay to do everything on my own. I can live a Spartan lifestyle. I can exercise. I can eat like this and have no friends. That's not healthy in the long run. We know that one of the key characteristics of centenarians is their community and their support system that they have in the community. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't see that, um, it, but it's so tangible. And we lose a lot of that nowadays with things like social media. Don't get me wrong. We're talking on social media right now, and it's fantastic for bridging the gap, gap between our two states and all the other people around the world. But we still need those in-person movement um, environments. We need to see each other. We need to be face-to-face, -face, feel each other, hug each other, yes. and yes. continue yes. to be together. It's it's remarkable how much of our health revolves around other people. Yeah, that is a great point that you brought up, and that is called human connection. And that's one thing that we're, I, I feel as a society, we have lost touch with. I mean, if you go to any restaurant, I do this all the time. I go and I sit there, and I have a rule where I put my phone either completely down or in my jacket off to the side, and I don't have it, like, present when I go out to eat with people because I want to make eye contact, and I want to experience what I did when I was 10 years old and I used to go to uh, dinner with my family on a Saturday night where we all like looked at each other and there were no cell phones and we had to talk to each other. And nowadays it's like, you go there and it's like a family of four is like this. And they're all, they're all creating text neck at the same time. And they're going to make some chiropractor a couple bucks down the road. <laughs> and they're like, they're probably texting each other even, which is, makes it even more sad. <laughs> it, and it's gone. It happens. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it happens everywhere across America. And again, I'm going to agree with you that, that social media is great. It's a great tool. It's a great tool for us as fitness professionals to get messages out to more people and reach more people because you know we had this conversation when you're in town about all the fitness hacks out there and the trolls and the bullies and the people that are fake and the ones that are always like selfie 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 and like boobs and butts and like all this crazy stuff that goes on on social media all the time and it swirls around so much it makes me nauseous i can't even stomach it for two seconds anymore and i we had this conversation and i'm glad i'm talking to you about it because you completely understand every single thing that i do on social media, regardless if it's Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or whatever, it's all, I do it all for the people. I do it because I wanna help people and I will not put anything out there if it's gonna be destructive or if it's gonna hurt someone or if it's gonna destroy someone or any of these other things. And I just wanna try to reach as many people as I can through a positive medium. And this gives us the ability to do that and reach more than two people or three people in our town. And it all comes from the heart center. It's all about doing something good. It's going beyond your comfort zone. It's doing a good deed every day without anything, asking anything in return and all these other things. And you completely resonate with that, which, which really is awesome because I told you I could probably count on one hand the amount of fitness professionals I met over the years who have that attitude. It's always just like something schemey or slimy or like upselling or, yeah. right? It's ridiculous. So that's just, you know, it's just human nature. Be kind to people. It's that simple. It's like, whatever you put out there, you're going to get it in return. I promise you that. And it's going to come back 10 times greater. And if you sucker punch somebody, you can expect to get your head taken clean off because your punishment will be 10 times worse than the sucker punch that you give to somebody. And if you give someone a hug, you'll probably get 10 hugs in return or something more. But all those little tangible things, the hugs, the handshakes, looking someone in the eye, kissing someone on the cheek you haven't seen in a while. Like John said, that's very important. That's powerful. There's like, we are balls of energy. 
powerful energy that we can transmit to people just by doing all those small things. Just by looking someone in the eye even and thinking a happy thought. I mean, I could, I could send positive energy to someone over in Madagascar if I want to, if someone's living there that I know who's in ill health and just put positive ions into the atmosphere and they could reach that person. I mean, you can call it prayer or you can call it meditation or you can call it just sending out positive vibes, but it's all the same thing. Do you have anything to add to that? I couldn't agree more, Kevin, on pretty much everything that you're saying. I think the, the community aspect is highly underrated and um, – not, not to plug the event too much, but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to spread the love of Indian clubs in Gata, running this event that's in true. San Diego with me and you guys with Inter Indian Clubs International have many more events coming on. But the whole teaching is revolving around community and getting more people doing something that we love and find benefit from. And they can share with others as well. So we're just pushing this message and this exercise and this brain training to more and more people. And the more, the better. I actually, I'm glad you circled back to that because I want to elaborate a little bit more on that workshop. And that is, that is exactly a good point. When we do these workshops, it, we do want to build that community feel more. Face-to-face -face energy, all these other things. And it's an, a, it's an experience. It's not just a come and get your CECs. It's not just like come and learn this tool and go out and practice tomorrow. We want you to have an experience when you come there. We give positive energy and, and chi out and, and positive vibes. And we want everyone to feel welcome and comfortable and important. Because you are, you all are important to us. And you mentioned the word gata, and I mentioned that a long time ago when we first started chatting. I want to talk to you the difference between a gata and a mm -hmm. mace. They're basically the same type of tool, but in historical times, especially in the zirkane, which were these houses of strength that the Iranians used to work out in, they were called polavans. And they built a lot of their tools from scratch because they were, it was like, you know, they didn't have the money to go out and buy things. And they didn't have maces back then and all these different fancy things. So they would take bamboo, and they would put them into a flower pot and they would pour concrete in there. And they'd have these, these anchors in the bottom that would hold them. And when they cured, they would smash the pot and then they would spin them over their heads and move them in uh, 360 patterns and 10 twos and different things like that. So Agata is basically a traditional tool that was made years ago. And at Indian Clubs International, we, we are priding ourselves in trying to bring actually the Gata back and we try to make them handcrafted, handmade. And going forward, we're going to be working on that as we speak. The mace the steel mace especially has become a very popular tool across America. And it is being used now, in my opinion, wrongly in a lot of videos I see and a lot of content. And I'm not trying to be an elitist. I just, I study history. And like Paul is like the master, the wizard on history of goddess and maces. And he has visited like Iran. He's been to India. He's been to all the countries. He's trained in the Zirkane. And he kind of knows it better than anybody else in the whole world, in my opinion. So he's a good adversary to have. And, and him being a, you know, a partner of ours in the workshop system is just going to add so much more value to be in there in person because you're going to learn a little bit more about the, the history of these tools. And basically the difference between a god and a mace is that right there. So that's, it's basically a, a stick. Usually it was bamboo in the old days with, concrete, with a concrete ball at the bottom and you would spin it around your head in 360s, 10-2s, and a couple different patterns. And the mace is basically made of steel and has a ball on the end and it's usually shorter. So those are a couple differences between the two. But as John was saying, we are going to be in San Diego, April 20th, mm -hmm. and the days are starting to count down. We still have some slots open. If any of you want to come out to San Diego, it's a quick flight out there. If any of you are in the West Coast region, if you're on the East Coast, come out anyway. Come visit San Diego. It's beautiful. If we have time, we'll go for a hike. Who knows? We can do, a lot Absolutely. Of we can do some push-ups. We can climb, climb some walls at Mesa, yeah. gym, uh, or Mesa Rim Gym, climbing gym. There's a lot of things we can do and have some fun. But anyway, do you have anything else to add? You got to wrap That's it up. That's it, my friend. I have a client coming up, so we can wrap it up. And okay. as always, it's a pleasure talking with you. And I can't wait to do it yep. more and in person uh, to enhance our mm -hmm. community. Sounds good, brother. Anyway, that's it for me. I'm about to sign off. And if you want any more details about the event coming up in San Diego, contact John mm -hmm. or myself or Paul or Kelly, or just go to our Indian Clubs International page and just throw us a message. And we'll happily tell you what's up. In the meantime... Go out there and keep it real. Hug. You know, you know the rule. I always end my message with this. Try to hug five people today. And it's late in the day. So you better go find some people to hug. And don't make it creepy either. Make sure it's people you know. Okay. Sounds All right. good. Have All right, Kevin. Day. See you, See man. You, John. See you guys later.